We are a congregation of many beliefs striving together to embody courageous love, radical welcome, and deep connection. And we are so glad you are here. Welcome. We offer a live stream of our services and extend a warm welcome to those of you joining online. We strive to make our worship accessible, and you can find an accessible order of service with hymn lyrics included at our homepage, uucomo.org. There are listening assistance devices with our ushers near the entrance to the sanctuary. And if you're on Zoom, you can click the CC button for subtitles. We'd like to particularly welcome any visitors among us this morning and invite you to find our visitor connect book in the greeting area or in the chat. We'd love to stay in touch with you. Children and babies are always welcome in worship and we have nursery care in the lower level for our youngest ones as well as a lively children's program for all ages. Children will be invited to their classes after a moment of centering and song. I have a brief announcement this morning about our church mission and vision process. We last adopted a mission statement in 2013 and the world has changed a lot since then. <laughs> this year we are undertaking a congregation-wide process of conversation and input gathering to revisit our mission. We'll be holding small group cottage meetings this fall and winter to discuss the direction of the church. We need as many of us as possible to engage in this process to be sure our mission adequately represents us all. Please sign up today for a cottage meeting. There's a QR code in your order of service insert, or you can visit our table in the greeting area, or you can look out in your email this week for a registration link. There are many different times and locations available, and if this fall is too busy for you, we'll be doing another round of meetings and a survey in January. Thank you for helping us discern our mission together. Now, let us settle into this time and place with a prelude from our choir.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Dr. Molly House Gordon, the minister of this congregation. I'm so delighted to see each and every one of you with us here this morning. I am a white woman with red hair that's very long on one side and very short on the other. Uh, today I am wearing a green floral shirt and a maroon blazer in fall colors and a white stole with um, rainbow pattern down the side. And our opening words this morning are by Molly Bolton. We are grateful. We are grateful for children teaching us that gentleness, care, play, and imagination are our birthright. We are grateful for elders, human, flora, and fauna who hold stories of our belonging. We are grateful for the wisdom of the land who shows us there is enough for all when we take only what we need. We are grateful for those who mend, lend, and collaborate their way into abundant living, teaching us the richness of divesting from greed. We are grateful for dreamers singing, dancing, and planting forth the world to come. We are grateful for organizers whose strategies and historic memories shake loose chains of violence. We are grateful for the courageous whose solidarity has teeth, whose compassion risks something. We are grateful for comrades who throw sand in the cogs of the machine of oppression. We are grateful for truth tellers, truth yellers, way makers, pattern breakers. And our gratitude is not a flippant thing. It does not gloss over violence. It does not forget about grief. It holds in its trembling hands the preciousness of living, feels the weight of all that has been lost, draws us to a deeper connection with all that could be, blooms us into a better way of being. Come. Let us gather to bloom together this morning, and let us be grateful. Our opening hymn is number 389 in your gray hymnal, Gathered Here. We're going to sing it once all together and twice as a round. I invite you to rise or remain seated as you are most comfortable. start east side this time. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. West side. As we now light our chalice, symbol of our faith in the cup of community and the bright flame of spirit, will you please join me as you're moved in our unison affirmation printed in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church and service to this law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, Good morning. 
I'm Jamila Batchelder, the Director of Religious Education here. I am a 40-something white woman with lots of dark blonde hair and glasses, and I am wearing a white and black diagonally striped dress and a maroon cardigan over it. So sometimes I hear when people are trying to explain you use to other people, they say, oh, you use except everyone. But I don't know if I would describe us that way. I don't think I would describe myself that way. Because I don't accept those who want to harm me, or those I love, or those who are most vulnerable and most in need of caring. This month, we're thinking about how to care across difference. And today, in particular, how to care for those who don't care for us. And I think it's a really hard question. I don't think just offering accept acceptance cares for everyone. It doesn't care for those who are being harmed. But I also notice how those very people who I feel don't care for me often make wild assumptions about my values and my motives that lead to their lack of care. So perhaps the first step in caring is practicing a caring curiosity, a wanting to understand better. Of course, those doing the most harm get the most of our attention, and so too often they get centered when we are trying to practice this empathetic curiosity. So we don't practice that curiosity for them to center their needs or put care for them above um, care for those they do harm. I remember at the start of the Ukraine war, someone like really trying to understand where Putin was coming from, an actress, and she was like, I want to mother Putin. And I was like, what are, what are you talking about, girl? <laughs> you lost the plot a little. Um, so we don't do this curiosity to over, um, over relate <laughs> to, to those who are causing harm, but we do it to figure out how to better care for everyone because greater understanding and wisdom can always deepen our universal ability to care. So we're going to return to a practice we did a couple weeks ago of caring curiosity. So think about someone who is different from you in ways that are hard for you to understand. A lot of them in the news lately. <laughs> Maybe it's just that person who's driving infuriated you, or someone you know on Facebook, or someone even more harmful than that. So think about where they're coming from in the most basic way. What kind of mood did they wake up in this morning? How did they sleep? How did their interactions with their family go? Or are they all alone? How might they be feeling in their body? How is their brain wired that might impact how they're experiencing the world? What history are they carrying with them? What heartbreaks and traumas? What are their deepest fears that they don't tell anyone? And what caused them? What values and lessons were imparted to them as a child? And what did it feel like to be taught them? There is so much we can never know, but we can listen, we can try to understand. There is something we can know. 
those people, even the very worst of them, are every bit as human as we are. They also are hungering for love, safety, to be cared for. They are also trying to do this thing of being human with all of its challenges, with whatever resources, tangible and intangible and likely very different from yours, that they have. May we remember our shared humanity and use that to commit ourselves to growing in our own humanity. And with our hearts now so widely opened, we hold those here with us, this congregation we make up together when we arrive this morning. We hold one another in all of the joys and sorrows, hope and worry, concerns and prayers that we carry on our hearts. This is with our weekly ritual of stones and water. So now during a moment of quiet music, I invite those of you with us online into a time of contemplation. You may wish to share your joys or sorrows in the chat to be spoken aloud in a few moments. And for those here in the sanctuary, you are welcome if you are moved to join us in our weekly ritual where each one comes forward, takes a stone from the bowl, fills it up with all they are carrying with them this morning, and then releases the stone into the water which has been blessed by our community and represents our care. Those of you in person who would like to have your joy or sorrow spoken aloud may write it on a slip of paper at the table at the back of the sanctuary, and it will be shared during our time of prayer. So now let us share this weekly ritual of holding one another tenderly in all our joys and sorrows. You may come forward as you wish. As we hold together all these joys and sorrows spoken aloud, we hold especially gently everything too tender to speak aloud, but held in our hearts. May you feel yourself witnessed. May you know yourself beloved. And may the source of love that unites and upholds us all breathe deeply into us the power of all that is within us the power of our trust in this life and one another, the power of our hope that rises in us even in the hardest of times, the power of our love which carries us through so much and connects us one to the other. The power of our anger, which gives us clarity to resist injustice. The power of our sorrow, which invites us deeper into our love for this world. And the power of our joy, which glimmers through every aspect of life even when the glimmer is faint, which carries us and invites us to the world we dream about. Let us feel the power of all these things deep within us. And let us sing in gratitude for them. Our hymn of response this morning is number 368, Now Let Us Sing. I think a few members of our choir are going to help us because this one's in two parts. I invite you to rise or remain seated as you're most comfortable. Let's sing to the power of all those things within us.
Y'all, I wrote this order of service last week, and then I wrote the sermon, and then I heard our choir this morning, and now I have a few changes to the order of service. <laughs> so this morning's reading will now be A Blessing for Citizenship by John O'Donohue. It will be followed by the hymn that was to follow the sermon, number 108, My Life Flows On an Endless Song. Then we'll have that sermon, and then the choir will sing, I believe, that one fine day. So go with us on this journey, please. I invite you. Today is October 20th, and that means we are 16 days from our election. So I give you A Blessing for Citizenship by John O'Donohue. In these times when anger is turned into anxiety and someone has stolen the horizon and the mountains, our small emperors on parade never expect their indifference, our indifference, to disturb their nakedness. They keep their heads down and their eyes gleam with reflection from aluminum economic ground. The media wraps everything in a cellophane of sound and the ghost surface of the virtual overlays the breathing earth. The industry of distraction makes us forget that we live in a universe. We have become converts to the religion of stress and its deity of progress, that we may have courage to turn aside from it all and come to kneel down before the poor, to discover what we may do, how to turn anxiety back into anger, how to find our way home. Let us enter these next days remembering that we live in a universe, that we will continue to kneel down before the vulnerable, and that we will not stop singing. Our hymn is number 108. Our, my life flows on in endless song. How can I keep from singing? I invite you to rise or remain seated as you are most comfortable.
your enemies? Do you not have any? Do you have disagreements, but let's not get aggressive here? Let's keep it civil. Or maybe you are told it is your job as a faithful or ethical or moral person to love your enemies, and you were taught implicitly or explicitly, that means we should all just get along. Go along, keep the peace. Or maybe you were shown that having enemies means nurturing hatred or violence, that having enemies is a path to destruction. So maybe it will be startling, and maybe it will be empowering, and maybe it will be disturbing for me to tell you this. I have enemies. <laughs> you see, I love my child who is non-binary, and I don't know yet if they will experience life-threatening dysphoria when they reach puberty, but I do know that if they do, we will not have access to life-saving hormone blockers in this state because our legislature has banned them. So I have enemies in our state house. And I love the migrant family our congregation has been sponsoring for years. And there are politically activated Americans waving signs at political rallies that say mass deportations now. So I have enemies in our political process. And, parade, and they were in the homecoming parade, and so I have enemies in our homecoming parade. And my motherhood is connected with the mothers in North Gaza who today are pulling their child's lifeless bodies from the rubble, or who are perishing with them in burning refugee tents. And the fire and the rubble and the destruction and the horror are all made from American bombs and paid for with American tax dollars. So I have enemies in our government. And I love the unhoused neighbors that I meet out on the street and joke with and share soup with in my work with Como Mobile Aid. And there are members of the Columbia community who throw glass bottles at those neighbors and shoot at them with BB guns and abuse them with slurs. So I have some enemies in Columbia. We are not in civil disagreement. These people are my enemies. Which is not to say that I wish any of them harm in return or that I work for their destruction, or that I forget that they too are humans. But which is to say that I plant myself firmly in opposition to the harm they cause, and I am more committed to halting their behavior than to understanding it. In her book, How to Have an Enemy, Righteous Anger and the Work of Peace, pacifist liberation theologian and Mennonite pastor Melissa Flora Bixler writes about the calls to Christian unity she has encountered in her work for liberation. She recalls one invitation to a multi-church service of communion and Christian unity on election day, organized around the idea that no matter who each one voted for, they would come to the communion table united in Christ that their faith would overcome the petty differences of this worldly politics. What she reflected on later was that these churches, largely white and upper middle class, would continue to thrive no matter who was elected. And that political differences are never petty for those who stand to lose their opportunities for thriving, their access to health care, or even their lives based on which people and policy proposals were voted into office. The idea that we can disagree but still get along when it comes to the matters that most deeply impact those pushed down and shut out by our deadly systems is an oppressive fantasy of unity. We cannot disagree but get along when disagreement is code for dehumanization, domination, and oppression. Or as essayist and novelist Robert Jones has said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression 
and the denial of my humanity and right to exist. He doesn't say this, but then we are enemies. The popular concept of a purple church, have you heard this? Where politics give way to our deeper humanity? It sounds nice in theory, but these churches are almost universally composed of those with the least at stake in the life-altering drama of our shared political life. When we insist on equality of opinion without a power analysis of who will and will not be materially harmed by those opinions, we have simply aligned ourselves with that harm. Unity in the face of empire is too often built on a blatant disregard for the harm happening under the guise of the status quo. You cannot welcome the migrant safely into a church that will not take an unequivocal stance on the violence of borders. You cannot create an LGBTQ celebrating congregation that will not take an uncompromising position on gender affirming care. Missing from these so-called purple churches will be all those whose lives are violently marginalized by the systems at hand. Missing will be all solidarity with those most vulnerable. Missing will be any possibility of a truly liberative beloved community. There is no pathway to beloved community that does not have enemies along the way. Because there is no pathway to beloved community that does not require transformation away from the politics of empire that are everywhere and all around us and toward a rigorous politic of communal care. Unless the church turns rainbow-colored and cacophonous with calls to liberation, it is simply aligning itself with the violent unity of empire. This is not to say that we must eliminate difference in the church, even difference of opinion. Indeed, the rainbow-colored church I dream about is full of profound difference. There are so many differences of identity, culture, practice, worldview, and opinion that are enlivening and life-giving to a community of liberative practice. What the Purple Church perspective leaves out is the power analysis that actually allows multiple differences to thrive rather than stamping out all but one or two acceptable, controllable differences in opinion. This is what empire loves to do, to narrow our choices to one or two in its own framework, and then suppress, often violently, everything outside of that framework. The reason we have enemies is not because we are different from each other or because we disagree, but because so often power encounters difference with an intention to oppress. In How to Have an Enemy, Flora Bixler writes that it is power that separates difference from enmity. She writes, I use the language of enemies in this book to describe a relationship between people one that recognizes how a person uses their power, actively or passively, to harm or dominate another person. When there are enemies, one is in power over the other. She continues, power is not bad. We need power to act. Exercising power is how we make our lives better, but calls to unity that ignore the dynamics of racial, gendered, and class power end with devastating consequences. The idea that we should not have enemies or that we should all just get along ignores the way power works when it comes into contact with difference. Imagine telling an enslaved person they should not have enemies. Imagine telling it to a mother whose child has been stolen from her at the border. Why then should progressive people think they do not have enemies if progressive people are aligned with the suffering of those most made vulnerable by our systems? 
Flora Bixler writes, the shift from difference to enmity is bound up in power. Who has access to it and who does not? And how it is used against some for the flourishing of others. Unity without enmity is not the path to beloved community when we live in a world that exercises power toward the death and oppression of those most vulnerable. In a world full of violent power, it is good and right to have enemies, even and especially as people of faith. And if you are feeling so uncomfortable right now, let me continue. <laughs> Because neither are we headed to a beloved community of winners and losers, us and them. We have enemies, absolutely, on the way to a world where there need be no such thing. Where power is shared, not hoarded or abused, and shared thriving amid wild and beautiful difference is realized due to that freely flowing, even distribution of power. Often. When those in power think about the overhaul of these systems of empire, or when they think of having enemies, they imagine the pyramid flipped with the oppressor moved to the bottom because somebody's got to be oppressed, right? As a people of faith, we reject the premise altogether. The powers of empire are our enemy, but not because we want to flip the script and oppress them instead. We are working on something else entirely, a gorgeous mutuality of shared power and thriving that the logic of empire cannot even imagine. The defeat of our enemies will not mean that they are killed or destroyed or even shamed. It will mean they lay down their swords and come to kneel down before the poor and turn away from war, and bend their power to the good of each and all, and give up the excess they have stolen back to those whose power should come from deep within. The defeat of our enemies won't even be a defeat. It will be a victory for love and for us all, because we've exited the field of the zero-sum game where your power takes away mine where we've left it behind entirely for an unimaginable abundance. As Unitarian Universalists, we are headed for beloved community. We are called by love. And so it matters that we refuse to pretend our differences don't matter. They matter. It matters that we remain actively in conflict with those harming the vulnerable. But recognizing that conflict is not a zero-sum game either. That it is a transforming force in our lives when we're willing to actually engage it. It matters that we stop pretending we don't have enemies in the empire oppressing us and those around us. And so it matters that we are clear about who those enemies are and who they are not and that we treat our enemies in such a way that pa paves the path to thriving for us all. So first, who is our enemy and how do we know? We must look to the power, not to the difference. We look to the power. So let's take a really hard example. The absolute devastation of Gaza by the Israeli military. Who is our enemy as we witness the dehumanization of Palestinians and the reckless carpet bombing of an entire population? It must not and cannot be all Jewish people, that is anti-Semitism. It must not and cannot be all the people of Israel, there lies endless war and a refusal to recognize the differences within a population. But the government dropping bombs on refugee camps and its power-hungry leaders and those who prop them up? Absolutely. And the government sending the bombs, especially when that is our own government? Bingo. And the arms dealers growing unimaginably wealthy on the mass murder of children? They are our enemy every day, always. 
we follow the power. Here's another one. Your Aunt Gladys, <laughs> who sends money to Trump every month, and who misgenders and dead names your child, and who uses racist slurs to talk about the migrants in your neighborhood. She is exercising power to dominate when faced with difference. And I'm going to tell you a hard thing, which is that in this behavior, Aunt Gladys is your enemy. Which brings me to the most important part of the whole thing, how to have an enemy. How to treat someone who is aligning themselves with empire and violence and harm and, is who, and who is a human with you. Because we're not just talking about presidents and executives, we're also talking about our families. We're also talking about people we love. We're talking about love in this whole question. We're talking about loving our neighbor first and loving our enemies when loving means absolutely transforming behavior to, away from harm and toward our thriving. How do we have an enemy as people centered in love and bound by human care? First, if this is an enemy harming you, who will not stop, you do not owe them your continued presence or your cooperation for any reason. People marginalized in their difference by structures of power should never be required to remain in relationship with those causing them harm, full stop. But when you have the space, and when the harm is degrees removed, though never gone because we are all bound together in our liberation, we are all harmed when someone else is. When we are those degrees removed, here's a way to have an enemy. You choose solidarity with the margins, and you maintain it despite the cost. You stay with the conflict, and you do not pretend it is not there, and you do not sweep it underneath the rug. You let the conflict breathe with the hope that the clarity of your love may invite transformation. It's not that you write off the enemy or cut them out of your life. What you do is engage your solidarity head on right in front of Aunt Gladys. You don't stay quiet just to get along. You invite the enemy into your solidarity. And if it means they are uncomfortable, and if it means they cut you off, then maybe that is the cost of progress toward beloved community. Notice I'm not telling you to argue with Aunt Gladys, but just to live your values loudly in the presence of thine enemy. To let the conflict exist. Let it sit there on the table between you stinking. The imperial mindset tells us we must change them, force them to our point of view, overwhelm or dismantle their arguments, show them the error of their own ways. Has that ever worked for you? Here's a spiritual truth. We cannot change another person ever. What we can do is have the deep clarity to live our own values unapologetically in front of our enemies, to choose solidarity every single time, even and especially when it's uncomfortable. And when we do this, it leaves a pathway to solidarity and liberation open and clearly marked ahead of our enemies. What we are doing by having an enemy well is inviting their transformation. While moving ahead along the path of liberation even when they're not gonna come along. It is not true that having an enemy is an invitation to destruction, oppression, or violence. Having an enemy means that we have aligned ourselves with the margins in a world of empire. 
Having an enemy means that we know exactly who and what we are resisting in our commitment to beloved community. Having an enemy means that we live our values out loud, even and especially when it disturbs a false and oppressive unity. Having an enemy means that we live our values out loud, strong in the belief that the power of love will overcome the love of power. So yes, I have enemies. But I also believe in the power of love. And I believe in the core of humanity in every person. So when I have enemies, I am also believing that one fine day the love of power of power of love will rise above the love of power. And I believe that enemies can still be transformed. I believe that the power of love will rise above the love of power and that tyrants will tremble as they meet the power of our inexorable love. I believe that the power of love will rise above the love of power and that our enemies will come to kneel down before the poor and that they will defect from empire and turn away from war. I believe that the power of love will rise above the love of power in my own heart, and I will turn away from all that makes me an enemy to those more vulnerable than me. I believe that one fine day, the power of love will rise above the love of power, and there will be enemies no longer, but a beautiful world of thriving for us all. I believe it one fine day. I believe that one fine day, I believe that one fine day, that the power of love will rise above the love of power. I believe that one fine day, in our service when we celebrate generosity as a core value of our community, directing our resources toward our love for this world and its people. Often our generosity is, often, is also a loving response to the suffering we see in this world and to the injustices, and our offering is an act of care. This morning, we will have a Faith to Action collection for our sanctuary and immigrant justice team. And before we take our offering, Dave will tell us a little bit about their work. And then during another musical offering from our choir, that's why they're hanging out here, you can give with cash or check in the offering plate in person, or you can use the giving details in your order of service to give online or by text. Dave, thanks for a word about our sanctuary and immigrant justice work.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dave Gibbons. Uh, I'm an older white man with brown hair. I wear glasses, and today I have a black and white checked shirt. Uh, together with Allie Gassman, Allie, can you wave in case anybody has questions <laughs> about the Sanctuary and Immigrant Justice Team? Uh, we get to co-chair that team. Last week, uh, any, uh, uh, Timbendale was, she's a member of the team and she was able to share a lot of our work. But I think uh, Molly said what we need to say today. We've got folks on the margins in our world and in this country and in this community. And some of our work is to help them in the ways we can. So that's what we do. We have a family from Guatemala who's, who fled violence, is here to, um, to petition for asylum, and we're supporting that petition in all the ways we can. So your contributions help that kind of work through this church and the team that does that work. And my message today was just to say thank you. Thank you, and Molly, thank you. of love? Yes. Do you believe that the power of love will rise above the love of power? Let us go and make it so. Let us rise and sing our benediction.